Why don't you turn to somebody before you're seated and let them know, man, the Lord is doing a mighty work today in this house. Hand me my uh, notebook. Well, praise God. You know, the Bible tells us over and over again, all throughout the Scripture, that all creation honors Him, glorifies Him. The Bible's clear to point out there's so many things in this earth that just gives Him honor. I believe every time the earth goes around on its axis, it's giving God praise, honoring Him. The Bible says if we will not cry out, Jesus said the rocks will cry out because He will be praised. He will be lifted up because he is the awesome, mighty God and creator of the world. And we love him this morning. I'm so, ah, I feel refreshed. We can go home now. Let, who's going to eat? Let's go eat. You know, I know that in the day and the time that we're living in now, you know, I, I heard somebody say this one time and it, it touched my heart. It was Sister Opal Robinson. She said, Pastor Ray, she said, if I can just know, sense his presence, she said, I can go through anything. It never left me. When I walked out of her house that day, I said, Lord, that's the truth, man. As long as I can feel and sense and know you are there, everything else, he said, it's okay. I'll get through it. I'll walk it through, and I'll come out on the other side victorious. The presence of the Lord is here in great power. When he shows up like this, don't ever underestimate the power of God. It wasn't just so we could have a, a good time. It doesn't move like he's moved in this service and this week or even last week. He's not doing that just to, you know, give us a party. God is always, when he shows up and when he moves in a great, mighty, powerful way like that, he's affecting change. He's doing something in the spiritual realm. Mark it down. God has done many things in this house this morning. Mark it down. And I am so proud of God. I love him so much this morning. So thankful for all of our uh, staff and our, our ministers and those who are going through our MIP and, and CAMS programs, so many of them, and we'll be, we'll be showing you uh, all along the way the different ones that are going through and, and graduating. We're really thrilled today because and this is a special circumstance. We don't always acknowledge and recognize everybody and give out their their credentials, but this morning we wanted to acknowledge Elizabeth Rodriguez. She's in part of our Hispanic ministry, Esperanza. She has committed herself and dedicated herself to ministry and to pursuing excellence and training. Her heart, one of the first times I ever talked to her, was that she wanted to be a missionary, evangelistic missionary to her own people. She wants to pour herself. She looks for any and every opportunity for God to open up doors of opportunity for her. And I believe God's going to do that for her. As she is doing what the scripture admonishes to do, study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And so we're honored today, not only is she one of the first women in our Hispanic ministry to be licensed and credentialed in the church of God, but she's also one of our first international folks who is stepping up into this wonderful honor and so elizabeth i want you to come forward we want to hand you that she is let me read this to you before you clap elizabeth rodriguez is hereby certified as an exhorter licensed in the church of god the international offices of cleveland tennessee is therefore authorized to preach and defend the gospel of jesus christ and perform any other such ministerial duties as authorized by the international general assembly of the church of god Elizabeth Rodriguez. God bless you. Thank 
Bless you, Elizabeth. There you go. Tyler. Love you. <laughs> And now it is my privilege, I would like if Cameron and Whitney and Blakely and little Presley, if she would lead the crew and come up here on stage. Now little Presley is the littlest one there and I'm putting her in charge. As you know, Cameron and Whitney have moved to be with us from Oklahoma and they uh, have served 10 years, I believe he has served 10 years as youth pastor at the Southern Hills Church of God. He also... Um, has just all kinds of distinguished honors, and I could go on and on about him. I could tell you how that he literally turned down an appointment to Kansas and Oklahoma to be the state youth and Christian education director for those states in that region. He turned that down because God spoke to him just like he spoke to the pastor. And God laid it on his heart that he needed to come here and minister to our young people. So this is where he feels and Whitney feels that they are led by God to be here. And we're excited that they're here. And uh, this is like the first official Sunday that Whitney has been able to be with us with the girls. Whitney, we love you. We welcome you. Uh, you are a beautiful young lady, and you're going to be a great asset to our church and to the ministry. Amen. Amen. And this pretty little girl, this is Blakely. Blakely, you want to say hi to everybody? Hi. And this is little Presley. This is the one that for months we have been praying for. And in her short little life, she's had a lot go on. And we are so excited that she's doing well and that they are here and already having a wonderful success in youth ministry at our church. Cameron will be, oh, oh bless you. Yes, bless you. Dios le bendiga. Yeah. Cameron will be speaking in the service tonight, and uh, he and Whitney will be here with the children, and then we are going to welcome them officially with a reception in the, uh, in the Family Life Center. So you want to be here tonight. Cameron is a great speaker of the gospel. One of the things that I loved about him 10 years ago was that he can preach. So you'll love to be here tonight to hear him as he ministers to the congregation. The young people will also be singing, so it'll be a youth night on top of it. So thank you. God bless you. We welcome you. And Presley, take them out of here. There's a lot of good things going on in our church. As we prepare to continue in our worship this morning, I shared a little bit with the early morning service following that song about how we're all singing of the wonder-working power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, how he works in our lives and how he breaks the chains that hold us back. Instead of just going in praying right now for our offering, I want to be real for a minute. And I always worry about being vulnerable and real because I worry about what people might think about me. But when it comes down to it, it's not about us. It's about what God can do through us. And people need to see that we're vulnerable. They need to see that we struggled with things and, and that we're real. And that we had an encounter with a real God. And that encounter changed us. I'm the least likely person to be up here right now at this moment getting ready to pray and receive our offering and I don't say this because I it's about me there may be one or two here today that's really struggling with this and two things that I struggled with seriously in my life was forgiveness and giving and I think if we're really honest with ourselves I think a lot of us struggle with those two things when we come to the Lord. But I struggled with it for so many years, and if there would have been somebody that would have stood up in front of me years ago and opened their heart and was vulnerable and honestly said that they were struggling with what exactly that I was struggling with at that moment, I, I think I would have changed many years ago. I had a hard time with my giving. I didn't understand it. And once I did understand that we do have a responsibility to give, the Bible talks about tithing, we should want to support our church, we should want to support our denomination, 
We should want to support our, minist- our mi- missionaries out in the field. But when it really comes down to it, it's not about that. It's really not about that. And I struggle with understanding the concept of how our giving, our offering can be considered worship. Because we come in here and we do what's expected. We give because it's expected. It's the right thing to do. But we shouldn't do what's expected. We should do what honors God. And our giving is about worship. And what we're going to do right now is not about you meeting some kind of a responsible tithe obligation. It's not about supporting the pastor or the pastors here or this building or the denomination. Although this denomination, the pastors, and this church is accountable and responsible for the administration of what we give. It's about honoring God. And there's an example of this in Matthew with the wise men. These wise men traveled trying to find Jesus. All they wanted to do was worship him. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, when they entered the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. They bowed down and they worshiped him. And they opened up their treasure chests and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let me tell you that the baby Jesus God, Emmanuel, as man, is here in this house. Just like he was with the wise men. And we have come and entered this place to worship him and to give to him. Not because of what he's done for us, because of who he is. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for who you are. And we do acknowledge what you've done for us. And we don't give today out of obligation or responsibility. We want to give such as those wise men gave to you back in the day. We want to give because you are worthy. Lord, because we love you, we want to worship you. Lord, receive the worship in this house today, Lord. We ask that that you would bless the offering and that it would meet the need of your church, the ministers and those that you've called, Lord, to work in the field. But our focus is on you. Lord, and we give to you today out of desire to please you and to love you. Because all of us are unworthy. And we all had many chains in our lives. And if it wasn't for you breaking those chains, where would we be? Lord, we love you. We honor you today. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. If you turn in your Bibles to Psalm 33, I'm going to get right to it this morning. I feel that there is a word for us that goes along with the work that God has done in the service. I titled the message for us, and I noticed that it's about 17 minutes to 12. Somebody turn that clock off. I'm going to get right to it, and I'll I'll be as time conscious as I can be. Psalm 33, verse 18, and then Romans chapter 15, verse 13, and Ephesians chapter 3, and verse 20. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us. Listen to this. According as we have hoped in you. Interesting. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in you. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Message Bible says it like this. Oh, may the God of hope fill you up with joy, fill you up with peace, 
so that your believing lives filled with the life-giving energy of the Holy Spirit will brim over with expectation. I like that. And this is one of my favorite scriptures in the entire Word of God. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And everybody said amen. amen. Father, let your blessings rest on your word according as we have hoped in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. What did you expect when you came to the house of God this morning? What kind of attitude of anticipation did you have? What, what did you do to prepare your heart and get ready for this service? From the way that it's, it's gone in the last 45 minutes, I would say that many of you have been working, preparing yourself for worship today. We talk a lot about faith in our church. We believe faith, and, and in the Christian faith, the idea of faith, the principle of faith is one of the stalwart principles that we live on. It's one of the tenets of our doctrines, faith. Faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith, believing in those things that be not as though they were. Faith. Faith is trusting and knowing that there is a spiritual energy and a spiritual work that's being done in the earth that has nothing to do with Obamacare, the federal government, or how you feel this morning when you woke up. That there is an actual work that is going on in the kingdom. The building of the kingdom of God is happening at all times. There are angels, the Bible talks about, that are dispatched all over the world as the work of God is being accomplished and done. We must be aware, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at some of the folks, the folks in the world that have a tendency to uh, almost disregard spirituality and the work of the Spirit in the earth not realizing that they're walking amongst the angels of God even as they live and breathe. There is a work that is going on, and it's right for you and I to get a little taste of what that was like. I appreciate the way the Lord kind of illustrates my messages. He illustrated the message this morning by what I titled that. I said, what to expect when you're expecting. That comes from a book I bought for a young lady in our church, a young mo mother and wife who, who was going to have a baby. And I, I saw that book, and I thought, well, that's a perfect gift to give her. So I bought the book for her. It's called What to Expect When You're Expecting. I thought it would just help her to know, you know, hey, what, what's that all mean? But I thought about that title as I was putting this message together this week, and I thought about how cool that is, What to Expect When You're Expecting. When you and I begin to truly understand how God works in faith, how the kingdom works, we begin to see things that help us understand what expectation means to faith. And that's what I want to talk about today, faith and expectation. Somebody says, well, isn't that the same thing? No, it's not. Although they work in conjunction with one another, faith and expectation are not the same thing. I've been dealing with the difference between them for the last week and a half. Faith and expectation. Expectation in the dictionary means to look forward to, to anticipate with the regard that is going to happen, to look forward with reason or justification. And I love this part, confidently believing and preparing for some sure event. Expectation. So expectation is almost like faith taken a step further, and that's exactly what it is. It's faith in action. It's faith as a verb. It's taking faith and acting on it, believing what you're saying, believing what it is so much that you're actually preparing yourself to receive. If it's going to rain and I want to catch some in a rain bucket, I'm going to look for the skies to 
look just right, and then I'm going to take me out a bucket, and I'm going to put it out there, and I'm going to let the rain catch in that rain bucket. I know it's going to happen. I feel and sense it's going to happen by the clouds that are in the sky. It kind of makes sense. There are lots of things that happen in the spiritual realm that we need to understand go hand in hand with expectation. We talk about faith that pleases God, and a lot of folks are, are, are good to, to talk about faith, and we got to have faith. we got to have more faith. Well, the Bible says that we're given all a measure of faith, so we understand and know that, that we have faith. The Bible says you don't need very much, actually. It says that if you have the faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed, you can say to a mountain, move. So we go back and we say, no, it's not necessarily true that we need more faith. We just need to understand the faith that we have. But what we sometimes need more of is expectation. Expectation is a whole different animal. Expectation will help us to take our little faith, put it together with action, and then it becomes a verb. How about that for an English lesson today? To truly know that there is a system in a way that God works. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. There are things in the Bible we read, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, then you shall ask what you will and it shall be done. We know that in the Bible there are prerequisites to God moving. He don't just surprise everybody and just, you know, it isn't like a big old lottery out there where, you know, you just kind of go. Somebody said one time, well, I mean, you know, you just walk and that's it. You know, you experience life and you just take your journey and whatever comes, comes. No, that's not the way it is. He says he's got a destiny and a plan. Jeremiah 29 says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and give you a future, and give you hope. An expected end, the NIV says. To give you an expected end. You can expect that God's going to lead you. The steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered of the Lord. We can take and understand that the Bible is clear to point out God is ready to do some things. Expectation is the key in the hand of faith. Oh, that was good. Somebody ought to tweet that. Expectation is the key in the hand of faith. Faith, faith, a lot of folks have faith. They say they believe. But it's another whole thing to say, I believe, therefore, I will step into this. I will trust. I will trust. God is able, we read the, the version of the King James of Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. The Amplified Version says this of that verse, God is able to superabundantly, far above and beyond all that we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. Do you understand that if we would just tap into this one verse, If we would just tap into this one verse, we would see more victory. We would understand more miracles, not only in the church, but in our lives. Matthew 9 and 29 says, according to your faith, it will be done to you. Now, again, faith, faith, faith is the answer. Faith is what pleases God, believing Understanding that God can do anything. But the trust comes in where we expect, we begin to expect. And that unlocks a whole new understanding of what God can do. God can do a lot more in the earth and in our lives than he's doing. Because we have not joined together with our faith and expectancy to see it happen. We must. You, you can have expectancy without faith. You can have grandiose desires. You can want lots of things. And you don't have to have faith for those things. But listen, you cannot have faith and see miracles without expectancy. 
they go hand in hand. And when you understand that, it makes a difference. Why is it that Winterfest, year after year after year, is always a success? They always have these services that are unbelievable. I mean, they get up in front of 24,000 kids in Knoxville, and they say, Jesus loves you. And the next thing you know, the place is shouting a hoedown. I mean, they're like running the aisles, and, and you just look, wow, I wish I could do that at Stratford Heights. I mean, you walk in there, and they get up and sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. And kids are like, "Woo, hallelujah. And then they're like, man. Preacher gets up and calls for folks to trust Christ and to trust God, and he'll be there for them. And we preached that a hundred times. They didn't hear me. It's because of expectancy. They get on that bus, and they know we've prayed over them. We've prepared over them. Some of you have fasted and prayed for them, and you've sponsored them, and you've helped them to get ready. We've told them, man, you get ready. I've been going for 30 years. I've been going for 25 years. I've been going for 10 years. I'm going to go, and every time we go, the power of God falls. The power of the Lord is there. It's, it's, you, somebody says, well, that's kind of like a little bit of, you know, psychology. Okay. How many of you know some of us need a little psychological help every now and again? Because the Bible's clear to point out that faith and believing is necessary, and that's psychological. The kids get on that bus, and we've said, oh, you better get ready. Oh, it's going to be awesome. Oh, young people, you better be ready. The preachers are going to preach. The power is going to fall. The singers are going to sing. And you're going to have prayer meetings and altar calls. It's going to last for hours. It's going to be awesome. I remember one year, we carried, we, I talked about it. Man, we, we saw the power of the Lord move so strong, we literally had to pick up kids. I had one on this shoulder. Somebody else had another one on another shoulder. And we were carrying them out to the bus. We just laid them on the seat. And they were this, praise God, it's so awesome. I love it when God does that. I love it when we begin overwhelmed by the Spirit of the Lord and He just completely just washes over us and saturates us. Somebody says, Well, God, don't do that. Yes, He does. Go away. God don't move like that anymore, brother. Pentecost was an exception. Oh. We'll come to 1045 at Stratford Heights and tell them people that, because they ain't got that yet. I have found him to be real. I have found his word to be alive. I've found that the power of God is there. And I have found something else to be true right alongside of my faith. When I have high expectation, I see the miraculous. Now, you can write that down and put it in a book and say, I, quote me on it. I'm telling you, when we begin to understand our faith mixed together with expectation, we will see great and glorious things. You'll see things that you didn't think you'd see. Some of us, we just barely hang on. We just barely hold on. We live in this I hope so mentality. We live in this spiritual lottery, hoping today things will be better, hoping that God will direct Hoping that God will lead. Hoping that God will show up. I'm telling you, half the time God sits up and looks at us and wonders, what in the world are we reading? Are we not understanding that his word says, thy word is a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. I'll order the steps of the righteous. They will be delivered. I'll be a refuge and a covert in the storm. All throughout this precious word, he tells us over and over and over again, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters and he restores my soul the bible's clear to point out one promise after another and we sit back in this land of i hope so and god says you've tied my hands we talked last week last sunday morning then sunday night we talked about taking the hands untying the hands of god what what takes god and makes the unlimited kind of power work in our lives. It's un unbelievable that now we follow with this. Faith engages God. 
God's promises create reality. Listen to this. This is good stuff. I wrote this. Faith engages God. God's promises create reality. Expectation is our trust that makes it true. Oh, you eat on that all day long. You don't even need fishes today. Faith engages God, and God's promises create reality. When you expect, when you expect, you will see. The law of expectation says simply, you get what you expect out of life. We tend to see what we expect to see. We tend to feel what we expect to feel. We act like we expect to act, and we achieve the things that we expect to achieve. But where there is no expectation, you do not have successful faith. Together with your faith, mix that up with expectation. And you watch, you watch how the miracles begin to unfold in your life. I've seen it happen in my own life. I began to pray years ago about my, my financial management. And I gave my finances to God as a young minister. And I was you know, wanting to understand it. And God led me through. I began to pray about it. And I began to say, God, I expect that you're going to help me. And you know, there was a few years back. This is, you'll laugh. Please don't laugh too loud because i got more to preach in a few minutes that I got. But there was one Sunday night, I was sitting over here, and I remember I said, Lord, I feel so unhealthy, and I feel like, ugh, I feel draggy all the time, I, I don't feel good. Lord, the collar, I got the biggest collar you can get before you got to go to big and tall. I don't want to do that. So Lord, I'm asking you to help me with my physical fitness. And you know, I'm going to tell you right then and there, he started guiding me and helping me. I started saying no to things that I normally would just... He started helping me, and I sensed that he was answering my prayer. I expected him to do that, and he did. I expected him to help me with my finances, and he did. I've expected him to help me pastor, and he has helped me. When I put my faith together with an expected end, I found that, that those two together make for a winning formula to see God move and to see things happen. In my life, as I've watched in the history of the church, at different places in history, if you study Christianity, you know the great awakening that took place. I mean, there was such an expectancy, a little prayer meeting, it always starts with a little group. It, it wasn't a lot of flyers. It, it wasn't a big old television display. As a matter of fact, they didn't have cable back then. And yet, there was such an expectancy that word spread not only through all, all of Europe, but over into New York. And then it started in New York and spread across the United States when all they had was a little bit of Morris code on a telegraph. But the expectancy was so amazing that it spread like a fire. From one continent to the other, this was the Great Awakening. Azusa Street in California. What was amazing about those two stories, if you know anything about the Church of God history and the Assemblies of God history, Assemblies of God kind of was birthed out of the Azusa Street. We were birthed out of Barney Creek down in North Carolina. It just so happens that when God decided he was going to bring Pentecost alive to the world, he started on the East Coast and the West Coast. He started in a big old revival, and the next thing you know, circuit preachers on horses were moving across the United States. And what they kept doing was they kept going from town to town, from mountain village to mountain village, and they'd get off and they'd say, oh, have you heard what God is doing over in California? Have you heard what he's doing over in Barney Creek in North Carolina? Have you heard what's happening? No, tell us about it. I'll just, right now, let's just preach. Let's have church. And next thing you know, it's spreading like fire. I'll never forget one of the stories in the book called Like a Mighty Army, written by Charles W. Kahn. He literally talks about how there was a circuit preacher who had worked his way all the way across the United States and met up with the group from Barney Creek. 
and he was telling them about Azusa Street. And there they were, he was telling them then about Barney Creek. And they were sitting down saying, wow, God is doing something from one side of the country to the other. Beautiful the way expectancy. From that expectancy, the church of God in its beginnings went from a little group of nine people in a little schoolhouse down in the country of North Carolina, close to Ducktown, if you've ever been there. Unbelievable the way that those folks were filled with the Holy Spirit, and from there it grew. Within 10 years, they were close to 20,000 strong. Churches being built everywhere. And I might add, a lot of persecution and a lot of trouble as that group began to grow. The group over in Azusa Street began to grow and churches began to come. And now you have, right up next to the Muslim religion, two Pentecostal faiths that are the fastest growing denominations on the face of the earth. The power of Pentecost and the power of God at work through expectation. Do you remember the Brownsville Revival? I mean, everybody in 1995 talked about the Father's Day at Brownsville when the Holy Spirit fell in the place. And from there, they say over 250,000 people ended up saved through that church. They were lined up outside of the Brownsville Assemblies of God. How many of you have ever been to Brownsville? You went down there during the revival. There's one. Any others? Well, the rest of you heathens? What's wrong with you? No. (laughs) Just kidding. We heard about the Brownsville Revival. It was all anybody was talking about. People talk about it, and they say, oh, man, you've got to get there two hours early. You you stand outside in the parking lot, and you wait, and they have to give tickets because there's no room. And you go in there, and they're open seven days a week. They only take Saturday night off. And it's unbelievable the way the power of God is working. And they, people would, oh, they'd get in vans. They'd get in buses. And they'd drive to Brownsville. And they'd sit in the parking lot. Some would camp in the parking lot. Why? Because of expectation. And what did God do? God showed up. Next thing you know, it's on CNN. It's on Fox News. It's all over the whole world. Everybody's pointing to one little itty-bitty town and in the little assemblies of God church. Because of what? Because faith moved mountains through expectation. Your expectation is going to see a great move of God in your life with your family. Standing on the promises of God. That's all it is. Expecting that God will fulfill his word, his will, his way. God will lead you. He will guide you. He will speak to you. He speaks to you first and foremost through his word. And he has said, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You can expect that. You can expect that. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even the youths will become weak and tired. Young men shall utterly fall, but those who trust in the Lord will find renewed strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles, and they will run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. You can expect that. You can expect it. But my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. You can expect that. That's a promise, standing on the promises of God, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all. I'm standing on the promises of God. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Did you hear me? And the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Another scripture says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, You shall be free indeed. You can expect that. And when you live in the mode of expectation, that is the key. That's the difference. Faith, as I said earlier, is the key, right? Faith is the key that you put in the ignition of the car that starts the engine. Expectation is the car. It'll take you where you need to go where your faith needs to go. Simple illustration, but so true. Think about this. If the farmer, I'm going to close. Gary, get ready. Help me. The farmer is out there on his tractor. And if you'll go by, I grew up on a farm. My grandfather was a farmer. 
he'd go out there and he'd spend hours and hours and hours going up and down the field. He'd disc for a while, then he'd plow for a while, and then he'd plant for a while. He did this for days and days and days during the spring. And he would lay all that work, and he'd go back to the barn, and he'd get up his, his trailers, and he'd fill it up with seed, and he'd go back out there on the field. Now, what would, what would be the cause of him to do all that if he, if he just thought, well, you know, I, I don't know if anything's going to happen. I, I'm not sure. It's a lottery. I mean, I'm going to spend hours and hours and hours and hours and money. I'm going to burn gas in my tractor. I'm going to spend all this time. I'm going to lay all this seed. I'm going to get it all laid out. I'm going to plant it just perfect. And then I'm just going to hope that something happens. That's the way Christians live. Well, I, I hope the Lord will come through. I mean, you know, it's been a tough ride. But, you know, I'm... Holding on. What are you holding on to? I'm just holding on. Turn loose, baby. Let God be God. Let his word stand on its own. He don't need you to hold on. He needs you. He needs you to trust with expectation. That farmer lays that seed down in the ground. And Virgil, he don't. He don't walk away from that situation and hope so. He don't go from there thinking, well, I, I hope it'll come out. I hope it'll be all right. I hope I haven't wasted my time. No, he lays that seed down, and he goes out every morning. He looks at the seedlings. He watches the progress. My grandfather used to put his hands behind his back, and he'd walk his field. After he'd planted, disc and plowed, he'd get out there, and he'd just walk. You'd go out there about five near sundown, and my grandpa would be walking through the field. He'd be looking. He'd reach down and grab a hold of them, see if they were strong in the, in the ground, and he'd pull at them. And sometimes he'd have a hoe with him, and he'd, he'd get some digging around some of them. But he went out there to just watch the progress. Some of you need to hear something today. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Sow good seed by faith. And then go out there every morning looking for the seedlings. Go out every morning looking for the seedlings. Go out every morning. Today, keep your face towards the sun. Don't look down. Don't, don't fold up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't get discouraged. There's no room for discouragement. I shall come through with great victory as long as discouragement does not come first. I made that up, by the way. Don't give in. Don't lay down. Oh, we're good. Us, us Christians, we're real good. Uh, one, two, three days a week, maybe. We're fired up. But if it carries out, you know, if it goes a little longer, if God's working things out and it ain't exactly like we think it ought to be or it ain't coming like we think it ought to, we tend to give up. Come on, God, you got two weeks now. Come on, show me something. We tend to give up. Then we're discouraged. Pastor, it's been two weeks. It's been two days. Nothing's happened. You see, expectation says, I will plant this seed. I will put this in the ground. I will do my part. I will plow that ridge there, and I will water that seed, and I will pat that ground down, and I'll sit back and let the sun and the wind and the rain do its job. And I don't care if it takes two days or two weeks or two years. I know I have laid the seed down. And God's word says I will reap what I have sown. So I'm going to walk out there every morning. It may not happen today. It may not happen tomorrow. But I'm going to keep walking with my face towards the sun because I'm not giving in and I'm not giving up until I reap the reward. Hallelujah. I won't stop. I won't give up on my boy. I won't quit. I won't smile yet about your dollar, but
I won't give in. I won't stop until I see the victory. I won't stop until I see the answer. Well, God spoke it, but you know, I haven't seen nothing. I'm just so discouraged. Get up. Get up and by faith. Stand on the rock and declare victory in your situation. Let God be God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He wants somebody who will expect. I'm expecting. I'm expecting. He's a good God. He's a God that backs up his word. He's a God that says if you trust in him, you will be led by him. You won't look to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. He says, I'll lead you, I'll guide you, I'll comfort you, I'll be a peace for you, I'll be a refuge during the storm. If I have to be a fortress, I'll be a fortress. Whatever I gotta do, whatever I gotta say, however I gotta lead, I'm gonna do it because you're gonna cross the Jordan River, you're gonna come through the fire, you're gonna come through the flood, you're gonna come through on the other side. Why? Because he has given his life that you and I might have victory. He wants you to have that this morning. Oh, hallelujah. Stand with me all over the house. Give the Lord praise this morning. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Jeremiah said this. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? He said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Hast well seen, for I, God says, I will hasten my word to perform it. Do you realize what that says? God says, I will be determined. I will be forceful. I will absolutely, quickly work to perform my word. Hallelujah. Expectation. Expectation. You need healing? Stand on healing and expect. You need deliverance? Stand on healing and expect. You need restoration? Healing, deliverance, provision, guidance. God's there for you. Salvation? He has you. He has you. You can expect that if he's knocking on your heart's door this morning, that he will not deny you when you come to him. He will accept you, cleanse you, wash you, forgive you. No, pastor, you don't know how bad I've been. I don't care how bad you've been. The cross is worse than any other thing that you could have ever gone or brought brought to Calvary. That cross, the blood that was spilled at that cross will take care of every dirty, nasty, horrible gut-wrenching sin that has ever been committed on the face of the earth. You cannot out God's grace. You can't out His mercy. You cannot. The blood will never lose its power. Glory to God. Expect it. Expect it. Expect it. Hallelujah. Come expecting. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, if you need Jesus this morning, he is knocking on your heart's door. The Holy Spirit is doing his work. I can't save you. My words can't save you. This message will not save you. It is the power of the Spirit of God that is knocking on your heart's door. And if you are ready to receive him, we are going to usher you right to the throne this morning. If you need Jesus and the Holy Spirit has given you invitation, don't listen to the lies of the enemy that says you can't do this. you're You're not the one. There's no move of God in your heart. Don't try. Don't listen to the enemy's lies over you. If you're even having those thoughts in your mind, that is him trying to keep you from it. It's time for you to get a start with an attitude of expectation right now at the very beginning of your walk with God. You want things right. You desire to be right with the Lord. You need him as your savior. Your sins are ever before you. Your family is about to give up on you. 
Here you stand today, and this is your opportunity. God is knocking. The Holy Spirit is wooing you, drawing you. And the enemy is trying to keep you from it. That's your first sign that this is the right thing to do. And so wherever you stand right now in this house, if you would pray a prayer to receive Jesus into your heart, you'd leave this house saved by the blood of Christ's sacrifice at Calvary. I want you to lift your hand up right, right where you are and then right back down. We're going to pray a prayer. God bless you, sister. God bless you, brother. Anyone else? Praise God for these two. Is there another one? Thank you, Lord. Anybody else? I need, I need saved, Pastor. I'm just telling like it is. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Any others? I need saved this morning. I, I can't go on and I can't go another day. I can't do this. I need Jesus. All right, these that have lifted your hand right now, I want everybody to look at me. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Prayer, I've said it before, but it's so right to do instruction here. The Bible says if a man believes in his heart, confesses with his mouth, he's saved. You believe that Jesus died on the cross for you? You believe he's the son of the living God? You accept him into your life? Ask him to cleanse you and to wash you of every sin that his blood has already purchased for you? He'll come into your heart. I mean, I'm talking expectation. I'm telling you, he says he's going to be in you. He's going to live in you, going to give you a brand new heart, going to take up residence right there inside. You mean he's actually moving in? You better believe it. Get the door open. He's going to move in. Your life's going to be changed forever. There's some Christians said, well, I didn't realize that. I need to pray that prayer again myself. You're welcome to. But we're going to pray this prayer for these that lifted your hand. This is a moment that's going to change your life forever. Expect it. Expect that Jesus is going to change everything right now. Expect that your life's not going to be the same from this moment forward. You're going to be transformed. We have folks down here that are going to help in that process. They're part of our crosswalk team, discipleship team. They want to know you. They want to give you a Bible and just shake your hand and be friendly with you. They want to make a connection with you so that they can help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. Please see them. Please see them today. They're in the altars right now. You won't miss them. They're wearing these lanyards, yellow lanyards. We're going to pray this prayer right now. It's all fixing to change right now. If you didn't lift your hand, pray with us anyhow. I'm not worried about counting you. I don't have any idea how many have lifted their hand now. I, I forgot. We're not turning in a big old count anywhere. We're just, we're going to take you to Jesus this morning. We just want you to get right with him. I had a day. I did it. I'll never forget July the 2nd, 1981. Hera Arena Camp Meeting, Minister W.P. Atkinson, Church of God Camp Meeting, and there I sat about to tear the seat in front of me in half. I had the devil on one side saying, don't you dare. You have to give up all your friends. You got to give up your lifestyle. You got to give all this stuff up. What will they think of you? They will laugh at you. You better not move. You better not move. And on this side, I had Jesus singing the sweetest song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I heard the wooing of the Spirit of God as he said, come, I need you, I want you, you know I'm here for you, you know it's going to be all right, you just got to step out, come on boy, you just got to step out, and I wrestled until finally I stood there and the wrestling match was going on, and then I went, and when I did a flood of heaven, filled my soul and my heart the devil went running and God took control and changed my life and then I became a pastor he's got a plan for you he's got a good plan for you and your life is going to change right now right now expect it expect it we're going to pray let's all pray together let's help them dear Lord Jesus come into my heart forgive me of my sins cleanse me make me a new person I believe you're the son of God you died on the cross for me you rose from the dead you purchased this salvation that is mine because I believe it and I confess it and I ask you to be the Lord of my life. 
from this moment forward, I will serve you. In Jesus' name, I'm saved. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Please see these folks here, but after service, but listen to me in a, in a closing prayer. And I want who's coming? Cameron, you're coming to dismiss us, or Richard? I want you to. We're going to have a closing prayer with Richard. I want you to do with me to begin a process of understanding expectation. I want you to expect everywhere you go. I want you, when you read something, I want you to just write down in your word, right next to it, expect. Expect. I want you to start with the promise, the thing you're praying over, the thing you're fasting over. Man, I feel the Lord. Begin to write next to it, expect in Jesus' name. In, expect. I'm going to expect it. And then you get out every morning and you start looking. You start looking for the answer. You look for the seedling. You look for what you've sown because you're going to reap. I said, you look for what you've sown because you're going to reap it. You're going to reap the harvest. You're going to see it. Come pray for us, Rich. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you're awesome and wonderful. Thank you, God, that we can expect from you the greatest things ever. God, we believe and know that there's wonderful works and wonderful things that you want to do in our hearts and lives. God, there's still yet work to be done before you return. And God, we're turning up. We're, we are looking to you. We are answering to you. God, we are looking to you, God, because you are going to move and going to work, and we are expecting it. God, tomorrow tonight. Lord, as we leave here today, God, we're expecting that you're going to move and you're going to work in an awesome and wonderful way, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We praise you. We thank you. God, we pray that you would watch over us today and be with us and bring us back here tonight, Lord, in expectation, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Amen. We will see you this evening. We're going to come and celebrate with Cameron, the new youth pastor.